Hi, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today, where we are lucky enough to be joined by some of our industry experts from NICE, Belinda Hayden and James Calder. Our session today is asking the question, are your humans equipped to welcome AI? Uh, I'm sure this is just going to be the start of a fantastic session where we get to really unpack some of those opportunities and challenges that you're all facing uh, and really asking that question as to you know, how ready you are within your organisation to actually step into the space. In the spirit of reconciliation, AusContact acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. And during that time, uh, with the help of our guests, we hope this session provides you some interesting insights into things that are in your control around readiness that can support uh, that next um, stage of uh, innovation and, and change for you. Um, we are going to have a poll happening when we first kick off, uh, so we'll get the timing right for that. Uh, and then to round off the session at the end, we'll have Q&A. So I'm Fran Southwood, CEO of AusContact, and I am your moderator for today. Uh, just some general housekeeping to run through with you all. Remember to interact with us to maximise the benefit. As you know, there's no need to take too many notes, uh, as we'll provide you with a recording of the webinar uh, and uh, some of the slides uh, that we can make available. Um, we do encourage you to use the Q&A button on the control panel uh, or the chat feature. You can ask questions as you go along or make comments. And if they're relevant to the content that's actually being discussed or the slide that's actually up, I'll jump in and, and we'll actually address it there and then. If it's something that's more general by nature, we'll keep that until the end. If you're listening through headphones or speakers and have some sort of technical issues with your connection, uh, just use the raised hand button on the control panel and someone from the Ails contact team will jump in and hopefully be able to resolve any problems. Um, alternatively, you can uh, revert to the contact uh, details that were included in your registration email. Uh, and look, lastly, uh, when NICE join us, they always bring a great prize. So today, uh, there will be a quiz uh, question asked at the end of the presentation, so make sure you're keeping an eye on the slides throughout. Uh, and uh, for the winner, whoever answers correctly and fastest, I believe, Belinda, um, will actually take away uh, a fab set of the Jabra Evolve 2 buds. Uh, so keep your eye out for that. Um, I'm going to stop talking. I'm now going to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, firstly, we have uh, Belinda Hayden, Director of Portfolio Consulting, International Presales from NICE, uh, and James Calder, Senior Director for Digital Analytics and AI, uh, also from NICE, obviously. Um, to get us started, we are going to jump in with a quick poll. So we're going to start with that. So the question for you all that we would love to understand, do you think your organisation understands and is prepared for the elements required to effectively implement AI? Oh, we've seen it kick in. And Belinda and James, it'll be interesting to see if you're surprised by this response. Um, yeah, absolutely. Understands yes, prepared no. Look at that. We've got zero people that have actually uh, led with that, which is interesting. Um, for the most part, this one. Uh, and then we're seeing a real sort of mix here between not widely understood or prepared, or there are still some components that need to be addressed, um, which gives us some interesting views for your session today and, and probably some some good understanding of, you know, kind of baseline with, you know, we've talked a lot about yeah. uh, in, in discussions that, you know, there's so much information out there and actually the challenge is kind of deciphering some of that and understanding where you sit in that readiness continuum, but equally, mm. what do you know and what don't you know? So I'm going to stop talking and Belinda, I think I'm going to hand over to you Thanks, uh, and let's let's get this cracking. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, mix of answers there. I think it's kind of like skewed towards where we expected to see. Um, I mean, I guess if we had a sort of um, a lot of people in the um, 
you know, I, I understand it perfectly. They probably wouldn't necessarily be in this kind of webinar. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, hopefully after, actually maybe we should take this poll afterwards. Again as well. at the end. But yeah. hopefully <laughs> we are here to um, enlighten you and, and really sort of, I think, just cut through some of that kind of mud and, and create a process for a business. Because a lot of the... Um, uh, sort of education at the moment is on technology and using you know the terms like large language models and that's not necessarily something that business people need to really focus on um so um just before i move on to the first slide in in the spirit of fairness we're going to let you know that although my picture you can see has definitely had some ai polishing this is not one of the pictures that you should count <laughs> so if you think my filter looks better than in real life, um, certainly he's taken 10 years off me, then ignore this one. It doesn't start until this next slide. Um, so we are gonna go through uh, this session, of are you ready for AI? And really what we're trying to do is, is to help a business prepare for being able to spec out um, the use of artificial intelligence in that uh, customer experience space. So first of all, we're gonna look at why bother? Um, what's in it for us as an organization, as workers, um, how can it help specifically in contact centers? Um, and then there's always kind of like that yeah, but conversation that we have with organizations. It's like, what are the risks? What are the considerations? What are the caveats that we should take with us as we move through that journey, just to make sure that you know we've addressed them? Um, and then we'll get to the sort of the real crux of it, which is putting together processes and saying, you know, are you ready for AI as an organization? First of all, what does that even mean? Um, and some key components of, of readiness. Um, and we are going to aim to leave you with some examples of um, processes and checklists that you can take with you as a, a, a bit of a guide. Um, and there's also a download as well, um, a PDF download that, that you can take as well after this um, webinar. And obviously you'll be able to access this material as well. So you don't need to copy the slides themselves. Um, so hopefully just sit back, relax and count the AI pictures. Um, and hopefully then soon a pair of those actually really good Jabra headset things will be yours. Um, so first of all, we're gonna go through uh, really what's the point of, of AI. And for this, I'm really gonna hand over to James because this is his specialist subject on Mastermind, isn't it James? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Belinda. Thank you, Fran. Thanks to everyone for turning up today and listening in. Um, it's it's very much appreciated. Um, I don't know if we're going to solve every question um, or have an answer for every question, but one of the things I love about this industry is we're all learning together. And collectively, when we apply our, our own needs and thoughts to where we're trying to go, the technology in this space seems to adapt with us, which is really exciting. So we're really at the beginning and cutting edge of what I think AI can do for us in our personal lives and obviously in our professional lives. Specifically in the CX world, uh, I mean, we're bombarded day in and day out, day out about AI and what AI can do or allegedly do for us. But sometimes you just feel like this 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 could be too much. So why bother? I mean, do I really need to invest in another technology? I've just got my head around cloud. Um, I've just got my head around you know the the changes in infosec and cybersecurity, and now I've got to think about AI and a and a seismic shift in the way I invest in technology. So why bother with AI? Well, we don't. We're not telling you you have to or you shouldn't. But what we are seeing are some trends and some data coming out. Um, that really is starting to help us understand where we should step, where we should spend, and, and how much caution we should put and how adventurous we should also be. So what we are seeing, what we're learning, and, and I won't just read out these slides, but they'll help us navigate this conversation together, is that the companies that are starting to lead and are starting to step away from their co competitors and really take advantage of this technology are the ones that are putting the money into it early. They're the ones that are throwing money at it. They're being cautious, but also they're being ambitious and creative what it can do. Um, and then when they do invest in that way, um, as I said, with a little bit of caution, but a little bit of creativity and risk, the agents in our CX space that are starting to use this technology are really saying that the engagement is getting better. Um, and we're also seeing the, the concept, we, we all know about the concept of um, assisted and unassisted calls and the benefits and cost savings that are there. Um, but to say that they were clunky in previous years and are getting less clunky now and are getting a lot smarter now, I think is a fair statement. And what we're starting to see with the introduction of AI 
that those interactions without a human being are getting better and better all the time. Um, and we think they're only going to get better um, much faster than they have in previous times. So where it's taken three or four years to get to where we are now, we think in six months it's going to be twice as good as it is now. So it's really changing and it's changing fast. And then there's the admin overhead, something that we know all agents and everybody hates. Um, but you also know there's a dollar cost saving there from a business perspective. One of the big changes and one of the most exciting things that we've seen is the way that AI can capture the intent of a call, the important uh, uh, aspects of a call and an interaction and take that admin overhead off of an agent and put it into the right systems, into the right places so that you can use your analytics tools to really understand what's making your customers happy or what's making them unhappy. So from a business perspective, we're really seeing that AI is starting to transform the organization. And the right businesses working with the right vendors are starting to realize that it's not an overburden in terms of cost. So this isn't a full transformation of the way that their networks hang together, for example. This is additive. AI is a feature, not a product. If you start thinking about, about it like that, it's not such a seismic shift. It's not such a, a massive step for you to get over. And then it's not just for the businesses. Your employees and your customers alike are starting to enjoy uh, their interactions and their day-to-day -day work when AI is folded into what they're doing. Um, and I won't read these out, but basically the trends here that you can see are that things get better when AI is introduced correctly and used appropriately. So I think that's a really exciting uh, trend uh, in our industry around AI. Yeah, and James, for businesses as well, we're seeing, aren't we, like the ramp up time to effectiveness for agents because they're not memory banks, are they? There's a lot no. of agents to, to remember. Yeah, there's a lot. It's a complex role. You're at the pointy end of everything. You're in, you're in charge of people's emotions. You're also responsible for the quality of the brand. There's so much going on. You've got screens full of data coming at you left, right, and center. AI is starting to become very clearly your digital assistant that's sitting, your wingman or wingwoman that's sitting next to you, feeding you the right information, not just information, the right information. And that's critical. So this we're really at a a turning point for for uh, this space and for the technology. Cool. Um, thanks, James. So really, let's look at how specifically AI can be used in contact centers. And I think this is one of the, the areas that um, we see a lot of kind of white papers and everything on how AI can be used generally in the business. Um, and we're going to focus specifically in the customer experience space. Um, so firstly, um, you know, this quite interesting stat that 82% of CX leaders are rethinking the entire customer experience based on recent AI advancements. James. That's a huge stat, isn't it? I mean, it's a huge, huge stat. I mean, you might as well say everybody's thinking about what we can do different and how we can fold AI into it. Yeah. And we, we see this coming through with all our RFPs and questions, don't we? And, and I think one of the key things that we hear is, um, you know, make sure there's some AI in it, um, which kind of always makes us think that perhaps there's a little bit of a lack of understanding at the executive level of what that means. Absolutely. Look, it, it, I, you can put some humor into this and you start to think when my fridge has AI in it, um, we've reached a tipping point. Um, but I think, like you say, that there, there, there are some elements of an organization that say, hey, put AI in it. And then it comes down to the rest of us to work out how. And if we can give you one or two pointers today on maybe some things to think about, we're doing our job, right, Belinda? Sweet, definitely. Okay, so with that in mind, um, we have some really interesting research here um, that was conducted by NICE in conjunction with ICMI. And we asked contact center executives what their top priorities are in terms of goals for AI deployment. Um, now, when asked to prioritize customer experience initiatives, contact center execs initial focus, as you can see, is on helping agents directly with real-time agent assistance, albeit AI-driven and, and generatively or proactively, um, right at the top of the list there. And specific organizational imperatives obviously would determine the order in which these improvements should and will be addressed. Yours might be different depending on kind of what products you deliver, where you are in, in the maturity space, et cetera. Um, but what we're really noting here is that contact centers are looking to add 
and enhance closely tied capabilities, such as continuous analysis of agent performance and automatically capturing and summarizing customer interactions as they happen. And it's those improvements that we think will help optimize the returns on agents' time and effort. Um, and if they're going to avoid spending significantly more to add agent seats and, and hire and train new agents to fill them, then Organizations really need these investments to quickly enable agents to deliver those um, improved customer experiences. Um, we're also seeing the ability to recognize and resolve customer issues proactively, ideally before the customer is even aware of it um, or aware of a problem and support for continuous process improvement and, and round out um, those kind of top requirements cited. Um, so proactivity and process retooling are a great fit for AI power tools that operate on real-time data capture, pattern recognition, and massive processing power. That will allow contact centers to, for example, correlate changing volume, reason for contacts, calendars, other variables with observed and projected positive and negative outcomes. So it can be great in the WFM space as well. Interestingly, in this question, one thing that all respondents put at the bottom of the priority list, might not be at the bottom of yours, um, is establishing a C-suite role dedicated to implementing AI and customer experience. That was one of the options. Um, I think this may be because AI, like all contact center tools, is a means to, to reach the goal of improving CX, as James said, rather than a standalone function that warrants a, a sort of a dedicated C-suite guidance. Um, on the right there, we have um, what are your top expectations for insights enabled by AI in your contact center? And again, data and data analysis um, are really ever accelerating decision making in modern organizations. So that's a big part of its promised value. Um, we asked where AI enabled insights appear most valuable at this point in the market's development. This is quite a recent survey. And so most respondents, as you can see, hope to use the insights um, that these tools can surface to power up um, unique customer experiences, uh, listing improving personalization as their top expectation. And obviously that's followed by staff development, um, insights, scalability, sort of decision making. So a lot of that is focusing on um, you know, intelligence. And if you want a full copy of this um, paper, you can find it at NICE titled The State of AI in the Contact Center. Um, it's published in conjunction with ICMI. Um, if you sort of didn't get that or you want a reminder of where to find it, then we can provide a link for that as well. We'll, we'll include the link, Belinda, in what we send out afterwards for everyone. Fantastic. Thanks, Fran. Awesome. Okay, so when we talk about AI in the CX space or deploying AI in contact centers, what are we really talking about in terms of examples of how we can deploy this technology? What is needed? And what are the rising capabilities and competencies? Um, so for us, the focus of AI-driven technology in the CX space involves targeting AI towards highly repetitive, lower touch and lower value interactions while supporting agents through AI in higher touch, higher value and more novel interactions. So what we're expecting to see um, over the next few years is a shift that agent skill set will evolve from providing the responses to prompting the responses, um, you know, from looking in their sort of AI driven knowledge, for example, to sense checking what the AI is doing and feeding back into it to improve the models. And so really a kind of like custodial management of customer facing information. And obviously, you know, some of that will be voice and some of that will be sort of follow that, that shift to digital as well. Um, and it's worth mentioning that supervisors also benefit from AI driven tools, supervisors and managers, specifically in order to offload um, repetitive management tasks, assign agent training, offer resources, provide insights needed to improve um, immediate decision making. So I, I think that their focus will gradually shift from, you know, micromanagement and jumping in reactive firefighting to coordinating and curating the um, CX orchestra, if you will, uh, much like a conductor. 
Um, and essentially, there are three key applications of how, of how AI can in, enhance TX, and these center on you know, augmenting that experience that, that exists currently, creating actionable insight, um, and automating tedious tasks. Um, and I won't go through all of those in detail because you know you can have it afterwards and you can all read. Um, so more specifically. In a nice world, um, here are some examples of AI-driven CX technologies across that augment, automate, insight um, sort of list. And the reason that I've included this is because sometimes I think it's difficult to match up. I, I think I know what I want AI to do and kind of what's the sort of a product or a functionality that, that provides that. Um, so, I put these on on this slide as a sort of a you know an, a, a guide for you to kind of then start to think of, of what kind of technologies you would want to be looking at, um, and specifically starting with XO or Experience Optimizer as it's um, shortened to by someone who can't spell that well. Um, before you um, introduce intelligent virtual assistants, obviously you need to know the content of CX conversation, what customer intents are, what's possible, what's easy and solvable to automate and XI can help you do that. Um, secondly, there's uh, still a great deal of um, manual work that agents undertake and they're the most expensive resource in the CX delivery cycle. Typically agents spend anywhere between 30 seconds to two minutes or even more um, summarizing the call during wrap up time. Um, and it might not even be a very good summary <laughs> that the next agent can use or can be used for insights and analysis. I call it sort of Bridget Jones summary, you know, so like customer recalled, asked for promotion, you know, without the use of bells and stuff. Um, and so it's not always good for the next agent, which I think is what it was invented for. And equally, it's not very good for insight, um, you know, so we've developed one that is really good at that. And also, you know, the expert knowledge as well that I've just put at the top. Um, which is vectorized knowledge. Um, and I may get, sort of after I've gone around this little way, I may, may get James to expand on that one a little bit because it's crucial, it's foundational. Um, from a, from a <clears throat> quality risk and insights perspective, we're looking at things like, um, you know, sort of autopilot actions um, and much of the CX content remains unmined. So it always seems to be strange that in an era when we're swimming in petabytes of information, why our contact centers still having to rely on random samples of less than 1% of calls to assess important aspects of the call and to ensure behaviors or important content markers are surfaced. Well, now we have like multiple AI models and they can mine information creating and relearning what good looks like in multiple areas and apply scoring, analysis, insight, and next best actions to anomalous content. So finally, um, thanks to the enlightened AI models, we can have 100% coverage based on deep neural networks and machine learning. So it just gets better and better all the time as it starts to understand your business. And finally, just touching on those three at the bottom, there are three great areas of opportunity for generative AI across the contact center space, albeit safely contained by NICE's bespoke CX large language model and the organization's own knowledge library. So it uses your knowledge as the sort of the guardrails. Um, so the first of these is Copilot, which is an interactive natural language generative knowledge capability designed to be delivered to agents themselves. And it also delivers task flow automation capabilities to both the agent um, and the supervisor, as well as insights to the supervisor. Autopilot is basically designed to be the customer facing version of that. So it goes direct to the customer. And finally, something like Actions clusters together the organization's data, metadata, unstructured data. So transcripts, for example, in a GPT format to surface insights and actions from natural language queries, just like you do right now with GPT. So except for, instead of write me a poem for my mum's birthday, <clears throat> not necessarily something I've done, it's more about what should I know about the contact center today? Or what are the top three causes of customer complaints in the billing space? So you can really you know, be specific. And this is an important new era for data management and investigation is it takes away that need to be a data specialist and spend hours translating and interpreting data. And that's traditionally been something that's quite um, complex for organizations when they're deploying something like you know, speech or text analytics. 
Um, James, any thoughts on that and expanding on the expert knowledge? Look, there, there's a lot of ground you covered there, Belinda, and I won't pretend that I could uh, uh, enhance anything you've said. Here's my take on it um, and, and, and the takeaway as far as I see it. We've been in this space and we're leaders in this space. Um, we've been in this space for a long time and we're a leader in this space. We introduced AI and used this technology as soon as it became available. We've been invested in it for many, many years. Um, the rest of the world has caught up with us. And the good news is that we're already there. And not only are we already there, but we haven't just uh, bolted on chat GPT to what we're doing. We have introduced CX uh, AI. So this is customized using your data or our data or a combination of both to give you and your customers and your agents and your supervisor and your business the best insights and the best use of the data that, that, that they can. I like to say that the contact center is the nervous system of a company. You can instantly now in real time tell the happiness of both your employees, your brand and your customers. That's unheard of. Uh, and we've been at the forefront of this for ages and we're now able to offer this to you in a relatively straightforward manner. Um, so that's all I'll, I'll say on that, Belinda, without getting bogged down. Cool. I, um, you know I like the detail. Um, <laughs> so, of course, there are some caveats with handing over so much power to something that's essentially going to round it all up and then manage it on a level that a human could never process or unravel and that's the point of it is really that it's going to run algorithms and equations and what if what you know this that the other um, and we could never even sort of start to do that level of analysis never mind just quickly so in generative knowledge as with any input output system the quality of the output is linked to the quality of the input um, and basically i mean knowledge you know, what's in your knowledge base, your knowledge management system, whatever you have. So as organizations increasingly rely on these complex algorithms and machine learning models to guide their operational decisions and insights, the importance of maintaining high quality content and data has never been more critical. Um, and if there's one single takeaway that I want you to have from today, it's that, that knowledge is foundational to, to AI. Essentially, rubbish in, rubbish out. Um, Errors and consistencies in data um, input or content can propagate throughout an AI system and become exaggerated as, as it starts to make um, decisions. And so it can lead to increasingly incorrect or irrelevant outputs, especially as you hand over the presentation of this knowledge to a generative intelligence. If you've got contradictory knowledge in there, you know, um, obsolete knowledge as well, then obviously that's going to propagate throughout the, the, the AI because it's not going to be able to sift through um, you know, what's current versus what's, you know, what should have been deleted. So this is obviously crucial as organizations move towards this generative and conversational self-service and agent support, where the accuracy of the output relies on the currency, i.e. the up-to-dateness um, and reliability of that knowledge content. So um, just think of this poor robot here, um, this poor little generated robot, um, as a as a librarian and sort of have a think about what have you given it as a library um, and it's a bit like saying imagine if you built a lovely library you bricks and mortar with all the shelves and books in say 1950 with lots of lovely new books and it hasn't been updated since so sure you you could still go to the library and you still have lots of useful resources and books and much of the historical information would remain unchallenged but there'd be no books on computing, technical advances, pro progress in leg legislation and equality, updated geodemographic data, sovereignties. You could basically get yourself into a world of mess. So what we're saying here is if you don't make the knowledge base updated and keep it updated, that's essentially what you're feeding Mr. Poor Little Robot here. So what's holding you back, James? Well, and just to add on to that point, one of the things to be cautious of is allowing organizations to keep repeating the Frankenstack approach to technology investment. Um, and what I mean by that is there might be one element. It could be knowledge. It could be your bots. It could be something to do with your IVRs. It could be any particular piece of your ecosystem around the contact center that you think needs changing or updating or reviewing, and that will be produced into an RFP and sent out. Um, we really shine when we're asked to how can we improve things? What's the contact center of the future look like? 
that's when we really shine and we really love to get engaged. It's really tricky when the businesses start to point you towards RFPs on one particular piece of tech. We love responding to those as we always do. But uh, as Belinda said, sometimes you've got to take a couple of steps back, get your knowledge in order and then build from there. Uh, and we're seeing companies doing that more and more. In fact, we're probably getting a doubling of RFPs every quarter um, in and around that strategy. So what's holding us back from being successful? Um, if you could just build out the slide for me, Belinda, that would be great. Um, these are all concerns, right? It's about um, will my customer accept the change in the way that I do business? Um, will they be receptive to the fact that maybe they don't talk to a human anymore? Um, what about my agent morale? Are my, are my staff going to be happy, my internal customers? Um, well, we see when we introduce this technology, as I talked about at the top of the call, um, we're seeing uh, agents and employees see that go through the roof when the technology takes some of that heavy lifting off them. So um, don't let that hold you back because we see that it's better for you when you use the right tech to help them get through their day and do the right thing because agent morale is very much linked to doing a good job for their customers and that customer um, responding in a positive way after a call. And we're going to help them do that with AI. Um, customer acceptance, interestingly, um, bad tech gets a bad response. Um, so again, going back to what Belinda said, if you start with knowledge and getting your data in order before you introduce AI, um, the customer is going to accept um, the use of technology more and switch to those low cost self-service AI models more quickly. Um, now, the risks uh, and data concerns are something that I think is bubbling up a lot at the moment. Um, what are the regulatory components and compliance and governance needs around AI? I think this is going to explode in the next few months. I think there's going to be a big push to make sure that things are compliant. Um, and I think we are in a great spot here at NICE um, in order to help with that, as I said, because we haven't just bolted on anything. We've been doing this and building compliance and uh, InfoSec and so on into our tech from the very beginning. Um, and then there's this concept of will a automated uh, interaction platform, let's call it that, will that take away the my ability to really understand what my customer needs and will I alienate them or not give them what they need? Will I be able to navigate the demographics of what a 50 year old needs versus what an 18 year old needs? Can I give them what they need? Can I move quickly and 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 uh, almost in real time pivot between a human and uh, an automated model? Um, will I look like my business isn't ready? Um, will I make the wrong move when I invest in technology? So I do need to think about upskilling. Um, I, it's not a silver bullet. I'll, I'll always say that AI is not a product. It's a feature. All right. So you do need to train up the people and train up your users and make sure that you're ready for it. Um, and I think these are the real areas that people need to consider, um, but certainly not be afraid of uh, in, in moving forward. Guys, there's a, a question here I'm just going to jump in with um, from yeah. Sharon, Sharon Clark, and it's specifically in relation to recruitment. And I know, um, you know, we're, we're sort of talk, talking more here about once people have actually um, sort of stepped into a contact center operation. Um, but we have seen some starts with um, different organisations stepping into the space of AI with their recruitment along different components of it. So some is about, you know, uh, you know, building different strategies you know, there's, there's a number of platforms and programs that are building um, strategic attra attraction, long-term strategies that actually um, organizations, organizations are starting to use. We're then seeing, it's like the old, you know, um, keyword searches, but it's, you know, a, a modern day uh, AI version where they're using it for actual shortlisting. Um, and then we've seen others start using it for um, their interview programs. So self serve um, interview to a screen AI function behind it. But are you seeing much else in that pre-onboarding? Because we see a lot post-onboarding. Right, are you yeah. seeing much starting to emerge? Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and to be honest, this is the one single area of AI that I actually feel quite cautious about because I think that the traditional right. data models um, are full of, you know, 20, 30, 40 years of not very representative employment. Um, and I think we've all, and unless you can actually understand what's in those models and correct them for you know, diversity and for the correct skills, then essentially um, 
you know, an AI model doesn't make any judgment calls. It just looks at the data. And if it's got 50 years of saying, traditionally, a, you know, a, a, a professor doctor is sort of white mid 50s, then it's going to think that that is characteristic that correlates with a successful candidate as opposed to, you know, the the, the correct education and, um, you know, this, this perhaps life experience or whatever. So it's just... Like I say, it doesn't understand what characteristics are sort of as a result of prejudice versus, um, you know, just happen to have been coincidence or happen to, have, you know, that that's been the way in the past. So this is the one area where I'm, I would be very cautious of, of using AI and simply because I don't think that the language models have evolved um, yet. And I don't think that the language models are transparent yet in that area definitely seen some failings in this respect in other countries particularly I know the US have had some very well advertised examples of yeah. that that um, historic bias just being applied yeah. within a whole lot of things um, so we're we're still seeing organizations within our membership really stick to traditional they're using um, automation and things like that where they can to actually save time but not to as you say Belinda make decisions um, particularly around some of that um, skewed judgment potentially um, mm. excellent thanks guys that was good yeah okay cool. let's push on excellent so um, how to avoid some of those potential uh, generative AI, AI pitfalls into the business? It seems like that sort of carried through seamlessly from the previous question. <laughs> so thanks a lot, Sharon. Um, so essentially, I think there are three main potential pitfalls in generative AI. And a, a, a sort of a substandard input into any of these could result in the bias that we were just talking about, um, inaccuracy or hallucination or data risks. So the first pivotal principle is to ensure that the large language model deployed is suited to your specific context. Now, for us in this world, that means suited to customer experience, contact center, context and conversations. Um, so we have the world's largest um, trained CX model, trained on billions of just CX interactions. So, you know, not kind of like generic um internet uh, model. Uh, and so what that really means is that when you ask it a question such as, um, how do I change my telephone number? It understands that what you're really doing is talking about, I'm an account customer and I want to update, provide you with my new contact uh, center number, sorry, phone number, or I'm talking to a telco and how do I change my number, not change suppliers? Whereas if you Google or put into chat GPT the same question, such as how do I change my telephone number, it will take you right into, um, well, first of all, you, you select a provider and blah, blah, blah. So it understands that the context is, is in a contact center space. Um, secondly, uh, really we're looking at restricting the source of the generative response, where it's getting the information from to your organizational knowledge and controlled knowledge content. So it's only giving accurate information and it's giving on-brand messaging as well. Um, so really it's important to ensure that that knowledge management system is managed and scoped to cope with updates um, for AI so that it can kick out um, you know, uh, sort of old fashioned replies and everything. And thirdly, the business is responsible for what is public facing. We know that, and there are some awful examples that we've already seen um, floated across the internet. So there are some simple rules that can ensure only the correct content is, is deployed. So we recommend setting boundaries or guardrails to prevent hallucinations if the answer is not available. And you can do that by saying stick within your knowledge base. First of all, the CX, the, the language model you're using is that we understand it's CX contextual. And secondly, only get the answer from our knowledge base. If you can't see it or generate it, um, then don't answer. So an example of a generative response would be something like, you know, what are your office hours? Um, or when is your store open? And it might look at the information from two different sources and it might say, um, OK, you are, you know, they're, they're open from, say, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. But 
you might also be looking at a bank holiday coming up and so then, then the generative AI might say, except for, you know, if you're asking about today, today's a public holiday, it's not open at all, or it's open from 11 or something like that. So that's an example of how it takes two pieces of information and generates a new response. Um, and generally, we also recommend that you set permissions and access for whether you're giving this information, the generative response to internal um, people to help them and then they can kind of sense check it before it goes out or whether it's going straight external and also kind of by role as well. So you might give different information to an agent than you would give to a customer, um, for example. So there's a lot of things that, that you know, we can do to make sure that we have those rules in there because rules rule um, in general. Oh, yeah. Rules <laughs> Um, so also at a holistic level, there are other practices that the business will want to implement to ensure a safe, secure environment for its AI deployment. Um, that includes data privacy, such as preferences, political views, etc. There are different governing bodies across countries and verticals that each business will have a responsibility to conform to. Um, secondly, data tenancy is also usually regulated. Um, and large language models are on the basis of the content, structure, and style of responses provided to the end users. So again, you know, make sure that you use an, an LLM specific to your context, which in this case is probably you know, the, the contact center customer experience, um, and that you also then introduce focused vertical or horizontal classification models, such as I'm in telco, or you know, I'm interested in CSAT, customer vulnerability, those models sort of going across, um, as James says, that, that's where AI is a feature, not the product itself. Um, making sure that you use guardrail responses from the brand's own knowledge and setting those boundaries. So you can you can actually toggle hallucinations and say, don't, you know, don't be too creative here. Um, finally, it's, it's easier to launch AI tools to replace interactions in digital channels like chatbots, text, social, and others than it is to replace a voice-based interaction. So it's critical that customers are already comfortable and confident using digital channels for CX before introducing them to AI versions of the tools. So take steps to solidify digital customer engagement channels before you move to an AI model. Have the right plumbing in place that will make AI deployments for customer facing activities and you know, associate organ augmentation um, more eff efficiently and, and sort of make it frictionless. Um, Ensure consistency across all digital offerings, including non-voice channels, so that AI-generated information is transferable to the next, especially human conversation with that customer, whether that's in seconds, days, or weeks. And it's generally considered good practice to be transparent about the use of bots or automation um, and have a prepared brief on how customer data is or may be used. You may even want to um, change that sort of, you know, your call is being recorded reason, um, because we sort of seen the, the first example of someone suing in, I think it's the US, of course it's the US, or actually it might not be, it might have been in New Zealand, um, for someone saying that, you know, I didn't consent to my data being used um, for AI. Um, and finally, we advocate the human in the loop principle, um, where a human effectively serves as a gate to validate and approve Gen, I, Gen AI output before acting. So one way to do this is to deploy something like Copilot first, so that the generated knowledge comes to an agent who can sense check it before it's served up to a customer and, and you know, raise the flag on any potential issues before they go out to the public. Um, and so how nice does these things? Um, so uh, basically, from data privacy and regulation, we have three separate options to remove personal identi identifying information. Um, we don't use any public SaaS models. Um, we don't use your data to train our LLM, um, data encryption, all of that sort of stuff, adherence to multiple international regulations wherever you're hosted. Um, in terms of the um, data tenancy, um, we also have... Um, sort of data hosted USA, UK, across Europe, and also Australia, um, again, to strict international protocols. The large language model we've spoken about a little bit. Um, so ours is built exclusively on CX conversations. So again, your data is not used to train the NICE models, but they are um, regularly changed, um, optimizing for security, speed, efficiency, et cetera. 
And in terms of the digital offering, again, you know, in, in the nice space, we have that seamless handoff across multiple non-voice channels that's consistent and transferable. So the next person, whether it's an agent or a bot, is aware of what's been happening so far to avoid that really tedious. Um, can you just sort of summarize for me what you've spoken to someone about? Um, we're fully transparent with our um, large language models and we make sure that we use your own knowledge base as the sole source of response with guardrails. Um, so we use that RAG approach and prompt engineering controls to allow you to set the model confidence level to eliminate hallucination. And finally, um, in terms of kind of an evolution of a journey, we would recommend that you deploy something like Copilot, which is just the agent first, um, that would then surface any potential issues in the hands of like a trained <laughs> agent before you maybe go to something like Autopilot, which is direct pub public facing so that, you know, obviously you're not um, exposing any issues um, straight away uh, in a public space. Okay, so that one is sort of takes, hopefully takes care of a lot of the, the sort of caveats and concerns. And want to move on really to, so given AI's importance, both in terms of um, effectiveness, usefulness to the bottom line, potential need for supervision, how ready are you for AI? And James? Yeah, you can take a breath now. Belinda's just covered again a lot of ground. Um, incredibly knowledgeable, Belinda. Thank you so much. That was um, really insightful. Um, so it, it, it comes to me, uh, my area really is thinking about, is the business ready? What are we thinking about? How do we move the business in the right direction? If we're a stakeholder in the CX space, um, operationally or otherwise, you know, how do we get our organization to step correctly in the right direction? And what can we do to help the organization do that? So what are they thinking in the boardroom? What are the executives thinking about? Well, they do expect AI to transform CX and that's great. We're excited about that. And it is a reality. We're seeing it every day. We are constantly excited to hear our customers tell us that their investment and then their implementation has not only reached the expectations that we set them at the beginning, but it's starting to exceed them, which is really exciting for us as a partner, a technology partner for our customers. So the expectations are not insignificant with that said, 74%, as you can see there, think it's going to fundamentally change, not just enhance it, but absolutely fundamentally change the way they do business. Um, and excitingly, I think for me, um, I, I really like the way that AI is going to change the way that customers um, perceive brands. Um, uh, there's plenty of studies, plenty of things you can read about, um, things that are cost the same to make. And the that the brand value is about the way that the customers interact with that and the way that they perceive, perceive that brand, the value of that brand. And that starts sometimes with a phone call or an interaction uh, with that brand that makes you think that that brand is better than another one. Um, and organizations believe that AI is going to help them get more value into their brand, which is exciting. It's exciting for us as a provider of that technology because it helps us move those investments forward and get those projects underway. But it's exciting for those brands that are starting to see how they can grow and take market share. Um, however, not everyone's there yet, as we're trying to navigate through today and give some talking points and some thoughts on. Um, really, uh, only half have a strategy. I think some of the numbers we've looked at, 80, 90 percent know they've got to they've got to do something and they're starting to build those strategy. But right at this point, um, I think 41 percent is an interesting number. Um, I'd be interested to dig into that a bit more and see just what that strategy is might be just to have one uh, or do something, and, or it might be more complex. Um, should we move on to the next slide, Belinda? Thank you. So what does it mean to be ready? Um, look, we define that readiness as the, the organization uh, are starting to get ready to leverage and integrate and maximize that technology. Um, and they know that that technology is going to benefit the business and its employers and the customer, as we kind of just mentioned on that last slide. So if you're in the realm of that either strategic decision making um, or you're a stakeholder that's trying to move the organization into one uh, direction or another, um, you really need to slow down in some ways before you run forward. As we've said with knowledge and we're saying all the way through this, just throwing an AI sticker on something doesn't make it good. OK, so what's our position? Do we like it? Are we cautious of it? Are we um, creative with it? Um, are we willing to just throw it out there into a, a particular division of the organization and see what happens? 
Are we going to try it internally, as Belinda was talking about, and then see where it goes? So what's our position? And it's not just one group of people. It's not just the CX environment that you need to ask these questions of. It's poll the entire organization from the boardroom to, um, you know, to every consumer that you, you get access to. What's our position on it? And then where can I automate? Again, slapping a sticker on it that says AI doesn't mean that you should do that or that it's AI or that it's going to work better. So where can I automate? Let's be uh, thoughtful. Where can I get my biggest bang for buck? Um, and then what should I and shouldn't I automate? Again, humans, I don't, I believe that AI makes us more human. And what I mean by that, it allows the mundane to be taken off us and it allows the human interaction to be more focused and emphasized. So there's areas that we shouldn't uh, AI, AFI, and there's ones that we should. And I think that's a great question. That's something that we all need to talk about and, and, and understand. Um, and where should um, information and, and knowledge um, benefit um, from having AI and, and who's going to find that useful? Um, and then where would where would this technology become tedious, right? Where would it become so frustrating to people that they would say it's becoming a negative impact on what I'm doing? Um, and, you know, where's, where am I going to get the best coverage and bang for buck? Um, and where can I get better insights? Um, I think if you think about the, the wheel the, that we talk about, the whole journey, um, I think there's a lot of areas in there that, that use it in a more heavy, a heavier way. And some, it's a more gentle touch. And I think these are all questions that you should be asking. Definitely. And I'd add to that, James, as well, because one of yeah. the questions that we get asked about as well is sort of, you know, um, what's the kind of time to to return on this investment? And there are some that it's going to take longer, for example, especially if you need to put your knowledge in, in order, first of all. But some of these, like auto summary, are pretty much plug in and get the benefits That's straight so. away. Because the agent, sorry, the AI is then going to summarize the interaction um, and the agent then doesn't need that 20 seconds to a minute or two minutes at the end of the call. And you don't need to kind of put a lot of prep work into it. So it's very much a how long is a piece of string question, depending on what kind of you're talking about and what state your systems are in at the moment. Yeah, those top um, three questions for me are the big ones, um, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, sorry, over to you. No, 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 that's OK. I was just trying to kind of like move it along a little bit because I know that we're running short of time. So okay. I'm not going to go into these in a great deal of um, detail because these are in your handout. And again, all I would do would, would be to read through them. So basically, the fundamentals of readiness start with a strategy and then flow through to infrastructure, to content, to supervision and, and skills. So these are the type of questions that you as an organization might want to work through. You might even want to workshop them with um, you know, a few people in the organizations. And then the next through few slides will take you through these questions individually to, um, so again, if you were going to, to run a kind of internal workshop, and we can actually come and help you with that if you would like us to. Um, so previously you mentioned you'd want to start with an AI strategy that in turn needs breaking down. Um, and so you would consider everything from the business's position and appetite for AI, um, as well as your customer's ability and capability to embrace that technology, along with any external considerations such as competitive pressure or regulatory roadmaps. Um, and then the technical element will be determined by the strategy and the roadmap. And in essence, the journey to AI readiness involves modernizing, digitizing, cloudifying, and unifying your technical infrastructure. Um, in terms of data, much has already been made of those data requirements, but honestly, they're not much different from good data practice that should already exist. So the impact of not meeting these can be exacerbated in an AI capability, um, you know, where you would lose control and visibility of those data input um, inadequacies. So, you know, you would want to make sure that, that this list is checked off as well. Put the little picture there in the bottom left. Just oh, that's a nice picture <laughs> and finally the knowledge area um, again we cannot stress this enough knowledge is the foundation of ai get your knowledge in shape first if it's not that's the first thing you should invest in because otherwise it's you know that poor little robot in the in the library with the rubbish and rubbish out um, and finally organizational governments you would want to again create governance um, and policies for transparency, accountability, and responsible deployment. And that's what this checklist would look like. So finally, workforce skills. Um, again, at all levels, often we've seen RFPs briefed in by management of 
it must have AI in it, says every executive ever at the moment, without any specificity of goals or why or clear understanding of what AI can bring to this particular technology investment. So ensure that this statement is widely understood across the business and everyone knows what is meant by AI capabilities and inclusion within specific areas. So that would be, you know, the one point I'd say on that. So in terms of the takeaways, this, um, all of those previous slides are wrapped up into a, a kind of a checklist. If there's one thing that you wanted to print out and laminate, then it would be that from the last few slides that is in your um, PDF handout as well. So moving towards what's sexy versus what's sustainable and who better to talk about what's sexy than James? Oh. Like, I don't know what to say about that. Um, now, now you, now you've thrown me. Um, what a great picture um, for those of you playing along at home. Um, yeah. Again, I think we've 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 touched on this point a lot as we've gone through this, which is just because it's sexy doesn't mean we should do it. And it's new and exciting. And you know, six months ago, the board members of every company's kids came home and said, "Look, I can do my homework with this app called OpenAI ChatGPT." And everyone ran back to work and said, we need some of those. They're awesome. Um, but realistically, we've got to make sure that what we do next is sustainable. Uh, and that's really critical. So everything you do and everything you think about and everything you move forward with, um, those of us with enough gray hairs, uh, remember every big evolution of technology. Um, people my age even remember talking to people about how email was better than the fax machine. We're in a big revolution right now. And it's uh, a calm head. Uh, everything we've said in here is just about think about what you want, think about where you want to go and think about what's right for your organization. Let's try and blast through these last couple of bits so we've got time for Q&A, Brenda. Exactly. Um, cool. So again, the next steps for what you can do in practical terms, that will be in your handout sheet as well. So, you know, building use cases, building skills, et cetera. And finally, um, a final consideration, consider the customer's perspective. I don't know if you want to Sort of jump into that a little bit look we, we won't read it through i think i think it's obvious to all of us we're in the business of making our customers happy so if we invest in technology and we change strategies of course customer first what are they going to think about what we do next and that should be pretty much the, the the question that we ask ourselves every day my uh so that would be my comment on this one belinda without taking time to read it through Definitely. Yeah. And basically just consider your business's customer demographic and breadth of self-service capabilities when you're looking yeah. at, you know, your strategy. Something like a telco has every age group and needs to make sure they still cater to all of those who are less digital, digitally capable. Um, and finally, um, James, who's doing it well or what sort of illustrative results could we expect? Uh, we're getting to the we're getting to the end. We're almost there. Um, so we're going to sort of wrap it up with, you know, where is it working? Where are we seeing it going well? Well, I think we've threaded this through the whole conversation. Um, productivity uh, with the agents is increasing. We're getting more from them and they're happier, um, which is really important. You know, we can't forget the human nature of what we do. Um, we can't stop thinking that technology is here to help us and make our lives better. Well, as we introduce this technology, we're seeing a significant shift um, uh, with our productivity. And we're also seeing our customers improving, uh, sorry, our customers becoming happier and our internal customers becoming happier. And, and this isn't a tiny 5% shift. This is a significant, more than a third uh, of our customers are saying that they're enjoying our interactions a lot better. And then the really big money shift for a brand is to see that brand value increase because everyone's happier and everyone's enjoying what they're doing. And as I said, if you apply... If you think of the contact center as the nervous system of an organization and almost in real time, see how happy or unhappy your customers are with what you're doing, it's incredibly powerful. So I think we're, we're entering a real golden age for the contact center with the use of this technology, Belinda. For sure. And I'd say these are some illustrative results. So come talk to us if you like more or specific examples. Yeah. How this has already been deployed in like banking, healthcare, travel, other verticals. So we have plenty of those. And don't forget to download your handy PDF guide, which will look like this um, at the end. But again, any of the information on these decks you can have as well. Um, come talk to us um, if you'd like us to you know, have that conversation individually within your organization. Um, and I haven't really left much time for questions. My apologies, Fran. That was almost perfectly timed without questions. 
It was perfectly timed. I think, um, you know, for me, the real opportunity, though, you covered so much information, right? We could talk about this all day. Um, but so much information. Uh, I love the checklist. I love the real opportunity for people to think about where are they? Where do they sit in that readiness lens? And even if it's just to actually go through and ensure that it's even been thought about, because I, I guarantee you there's people that are like, oh, hadn't considered that. So we will make sure that all of that is available in the information that we send out to everybody, including a link to um, the research paper that you referenced during the session. Um, I know we had a prize on offer and we were looking for people to um, tell us how many uh, AI generated um, images we saw throughout. Was that right? Yeah. It was, yep. Okay. So we're getting people to jump oh, in there. Some, there's, there's, some answers. there's numbers coming in. Ooh, some big numbers. Ooh, I don't see those. Let me Ooh, go into the chat. The chat. I, I yeah. think what we'll do, though, is we'll uh, let you. Um, oh, well, I think we have a, a winner, actually, right we at the top. We do have a winner. Right at the top? Right at the top with uh, Marie. Andrew oh, Paul. yeah, there we go. Yeah. Beautiful. Congratulations, Marie. Beautiful okay, job. well... We'll uh, include Marie's details and uh, get that prize out to her as well. So well done. Guys, Hi. thank you so much for today. That that session was awesome. Um, and I, I don't think it matters how many, I know you said at the beginning, you know, you're kind of hearing it everywhere. Actually, it's still got to be practical and it's still yeah. going to be information that people can take something away from. So I, I think you've done a great job today. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed it. As I said, we'll send out all of the details uh, in the coming week. Uh, and if you need anything else or you've got any specific questions, I know that James and Belinda are more than happy for you to, ha to reach out to them. Come find us on LinkedIn. Yeah. Reach out. We're here to help. Yeah. Look forward to awesome. the next one. And thank you, Fran and the team. It was amazing. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, sure. guys, Thanks and we'll, we'll see both of you at uh, different awards sessions, I think, in the coming weeks. So Can't awesome. wait. We will see. Yeah. Enjoy, everybody. Enjoy, Enjoy the rest of your day. See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.